Twas early in a fine summer's morning. As Hello and welcome to the Irish History Podcast. My name is Finn Dwyer and this is the third deep dive in the Murder at Mother Mountain series. Now, as is the case with all the deep dives, this podcast has spoilers for the first three installments of the series. So if you're not up to speed yet, I'd really recommend going back and listening to the first three parts of Murder at Mother Mountain and then coming back to this show. Now, for everyone who is up to speed, you will have followed Ellen and William through their trial in part three. So in this third deep dive in the series, we're going to get in behind the scenes in the 19th century legal system in Ireland to see exactly how it functioned. And I'm delighted to have Neve Howland to explain this to us. Now, Neve is an associate professor and head of the School of Law at UCD. She's also an expert on the 19th century legal system. So over the course of our interview, Neve explains how a murder trial worked at the time. Well, we also look at some of the bizarre quirks in the 19th century legal system and we'll finish up by looking at how adultery was viewed by the courts as well. There's lots ahead of us. Now, if you're enjoying Murder at Mother Mountain, you can get exclusive ad-free early access to the next instalment in the series on Patreon and Acast+. Plus. Now, that episode, called The Punishment, drops at patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast and Acast Plus on Wednesday the 6th. You can get that in the links in the show notes below and it really helps out the show as well. Now to begin our conversation, I asked Neve to explain what was the first steps in a 19th century murder trial like the one featured in Murder at Mother Mountain. So the first thing that the police were supposed to do after they arrested someone was to take them in front of the local magistrate. So this was a local judge. It could be a justice of the peace. It could be a resident magistrate. And the magistrate would then make a decision whether or not to release the suspects, to discharge them altogether or to let them out on payment of bail. So what the magistrate had to do is determine if there was a reasonable case against the accused persons. So if there was what they called a prima facie case. So the magistrate would look at whatever prosecution evidence was available so far. So whatever the police had so far, it may be that there was eyewitnesses, it may be that they were caught in the act or circumstantial evidence. Now the police could at that stage introduce any witnesses that they had. So witnesses could testify before the magistrate and anything that the witnesses said would be taken down in writing just in case the story changed at a later stage or if the person wasn't available to testify at the main trial. The magistrate wasn't allowed to question the prisoner, the accused person, but they could ask the accused person, is there anything you would like to say? So the accused person or persons did have an opportunity to speak on their own behalf at this stage in the proceedings. And the accused person could also cross-examine any of those witnesses that had been introduced by the police. In order for the magistrate to decide that um, someone should be committed to jail pending uh, a trial, they had to be convinced that there was positive and credible evidence. And that was the term used in the relevant legislation. Now, sometimes at this initial stage, this first magisterial hearing, there wouldn't quite be enough evidence yet to make this finding that the person should be sent on for trial. So the magistrate could remand the prisoner in custody for a few more days to give the police a bit more time to find more evidence. Neve explained, though, that the police investigations at the time were pretty rudimentary. The Royal Irish Constabulary in the 1840s didn't have the equivalent of a murder squad. There weren't really a lot of um, specialised detectives. So it would just generally be the local police officers. They usually didn't have any special training for this kind of detective work. So they would just do their best. They would go and ask questions. They try and build a case. They'd look at any um, pieces of evidence um, and they try to piece something together uh, from what was available. While the magisterial hearing was the most common way cases were initiated, as we heard in part three, this is not what happened to Ellen. In her case, the inquest of Daniel played a key role. Neve now explains the role of the coroner in convening an inquest. 
Yeah, so the inquest was presided over by the local coroner and each district had their own coroner. Anytime there was a sudden or a suspicious death, the coroner had to be notified by the local police. So if a body was discovered or there was a suspected murder, now depending on what information was available to the coroner, the coroner would then decide whether it was necessary to hold an inquest. If an inquest was considered necessary, the coroner would then order the local sheriff to go and get uh, people to sit on a coroner's jury or the inquest jury. And these would generally be local people. Um, There weren't any specific qualifications that you needed to sit on a coroner's jury. Um, It was really just whoever they could grab at short notice because speed was really of the essence because the body would start to decompose quite quickly. So the coroner would then order that the body be brought somewhere convenient in order to hold the inquest. So it didn't have to be brought to a specific place. Sometimes it might happen in a courthouse or a town hall or a local infirmary, but sometimes it was just a local pub or somebody's house, maybe the house of a of a family member or just the nearest house to where the body was found. So again, speed was of the essence. They weren't that fussy about where uh, the inquest was was held as long as it happened fairly quickly. So for the inquest, you had to have a verdict that was agreed by 12 jurors. And in order to ensure that they had the agreement of 12, usually they summoned more than 12 people to sit on the jury. So that even if there were a few who disagreed, they'd still have 12. So they might take 15 or 16, or if it was a really tricky or controversial case, they might go up as far as 24. These inquests could be pretty gruesome affairs, and given the wounds Daniel Berkeley had sustained, his must have been especially so. These jurors would be sworn in, and then they'd have to go and look at the body as it was laid out in the pub or the person's house or wherever it was. So they'd make their own examination of the body, and then they would hear evidence from a medical expert. Sometimes they'd also hear evidence from other witnesses who maybe had seen what happened or they'd seen the deceased person the night before or they'd you know, been, been around in the vicinity when the accident happened. If there was already a suspect at this stage, that person could have legal representation at the inquest and they could go to the inquest themselves. They could ask questions of the witnesses and they could answer questions that were put to them. So again, this was quite different from how it would be at the trial itself, where people didn't get to testify on their own behalf. So the inquest, it could take a couple of hours um, by the time everybody looked at the body and listened to the evidence. And the jury would then give their verdict about the cause of death. And they usually gave a few lines of commentary about the death as well. If they found that it was an accidental death, no more action needed to be taken from the point of view of the legal system. But if they found the death had been caused by someone else, then the legal proceedings would continue. And there were different types of of verdict that the coroner's jury could give. They didn't necessarily have to be tied into a particular form of words or a particular wording of their verdict. In this process, the coroner was an extremely powerful local figure and could, as was the case with Ellen and William Walsh, expedite the case and bypassed the magisterial hearing. The coroner was quite a powerful figure in the context of the local administration of the criminal justice. The coroners could do a lot of things that magistrates could do. So they had very similar powers to magistrates. So, for example, they had the power to compel witnesses to appear before them at the inquest. They could order that a post-mortem examination be conducted by a medical person. They could order, for example, that the contents of a person's stomach would be analysed to maybe see if they'd been poisoned. They could also order that a body would be disinterred if that was something that was deemed necessary. So if a funeral had already taken place, the coroner could issue a warrant for people's arrest. And the coroner also had the power to send the prisoner directly for trial. They could essentially bypass the magisterial inquest. So there were kind of parallel systems it wasn't always clear who had jurisdiction over what because there was a bit of an overlap between the jurisdiction of the coroner and the jurisdiction of the magistrate. 
in addition to all these powers, the coroner wouldn't have been bound by the rules of evidence and procedure that a trial judge would have been bound by at a criminal trial. And inquests tended to be fairly casual, a lot less formalized because, you know, you're squashed into somebody's house or you're in the back room of a pub. There's maybe 30 people all kind of crowding in. Sometimes onlookers would come. It wasn't necessarily held in private and people would be coming and going and chatting in the background. And it could be a bit chaotic uh, at the inquest. As Ellen and William's case progressed, they were sent forward to the county assizes, basically a higher court, which was convened four times a year. In the 21st century in Ireland, a state official called the Director of Public Prosecutions plays a pivotal role in prosecuting cases. However, as Neve now explains, in the 19th century, it remained a far more localised process. So in the 1840s, there wasn't a director of public prosecutions or a Crown Prosecution Service. What there was were, first of all, there were Crown solicitors. So these were solicitors who were paid a salary by the Crown or by the state, and they would have prosecuted all the serious violent crimes at the Assizes in their county or in their area. Now, the Crown solicitors themselves didn't make the decision whether or not a case was to go to trial. They were told to go and prosecute this murder or this manslaughter. The decision about whether or not a case would be sent to trial, which is a big part of the DPP's role in modern times, that decision was either taken, was jointly taken by the magistrates at that magisterial hearing and by the grand jury who had another hearing at the assizes. So essentially the decision whether or not to prosecute a particular case was taken at two stages. First of all, at a magisterial inquest or inquiry, and then secondly, by the grand jury at the assizes. And again, the question was, is there enough evidence here to justify bringing this case to trial? So the grand jury would just be looking at what's the prosecution evidence. They would sit in private, they'd call the prosecution witnesses in, And then they deliberate privately and then decide if there was a true bill or if the case should be sent forward for trial by a trial jury. So while there wasn't a director of public prosecutions at that stage, there was a fairly well established um, local and and national machinery for uh, determining if cases would be tried. As we heard in part three, by the time the case went forward for trial at the county assizes, Ellen had reduced her age, claiming she was only 38 when she was in fact 43. I asked Neve why she might have done this. There wouldn't really be a legal reason for this, but it could be part of a strategy to make the accused person appear less culpable and maybe less responsible for her actions. A cornerstone of the modern legal process is the concept of a trial by a jury of one's peers. Now, given this was the 19th century and we know that it was a deeply unequal world, I asked Neve, could Ellen and William really have had a jury of their peers at the time? Now, Neve's answer here is fascinating because she explains it's a bit complex as the term a jury of one's peers, as we understand it today, didn't exist in the 19th century. She began, though, by explaining who had the right to sit on juries at the time. Only men could sit on juries to start with. And anyone who sat on a jury had to own property. And it was set out in legislation how much property they had to own. So we're talking about um, owning a freehold or a leasehold or some kind of an interest in land, usually between £10 and £15. So that was, that was beyond the reach of quite a large proportion of the population at that time who didn't own their own land. So the poorest people just didn't qualify to sit on a jury. The idea of a representative jury is actually quite a modern one. So juries have been around for a really long time, but it's only in the 20th century that we started to say, well, the people who sit on a jury should broadly look like the people who are being tried before the courts. Even though this phrase, a jury of one's peers, is used quite a lot historically, really what they mean by peers is people who are not legally qualified. So people who are not a judge, um, not a lawyer, 
not a coroner, not a magistrate. Um, and that's really what it means at that stage. There's no real sense that um, people should be tried by people who are like them. The other thing I should say about the, the juries at that time was that in 1845, there would have been very few Catholics who would have qualified to sit on a jury. So that's another way in which um, the two defendants here weren't represented. Now, there wasn't a law against Catholics sitting on the jury, but the way that the property requirements were set out and the discretionary powers that local sheriffs had meant that it was actually quite unusual to have Catholics on a jury at that point. Next, I asked Neve if we know about how the biases of juries played out in their decision making. Well, the one thing about juries is they do all their deliberations behind closed doors and we never really find out what it is that they've said to one another and what's been the deciding factor for them. So apart from a few instances where they give us a glimpse into their, into their way of thinking, usually we're, we're just speculating about why they did a particular thing, why they found this person guilty of this crime and so on. So we can, we can speculate. Um, and there have been studies which show that, you know, a jury... A jury is less sympathetic to people who they perceive as being different to them. And that's probably a bit of human nature as well. At different points in the 19th century, there was a perception, for example, that when there were agrarian outrages being uh, committed in the countryside, that defendants in those cases should be tried somewhere else, brought to a big city and tried by a city, a city jury in Dublin or maybe in Cork. Um, to get away from the bias in, in, in those situations. So definitely at different points, you know, there have been perceptions that uh, certain groups of people were less likely to get a fair trial or, you know, that there was more likely to be a bias against them. Towards the end of part three, we heard how William was sentenced to death while Ellen was sentenced to transportation to Australia for life. I speculated in that episode that Ellen's harsh sentence might indicate the judge believed she was guilty of more than she had been accused of. So I asked Neve what she made of her sentence. The sentence that was imposed on Ellen would have been at the severe end of the scale, but it wasn't completely out of line for the times. So for murder, there was a mandatory death sentence, but for an accessory after the fact, there was a range of sentences available to the judge. Now, a few years after this case. In 1861, there was new legislation passed which said that the maximum punishment for an accessory after the fact for murder could be penal servitude for life. Now, penal transportation for Ireland had stopped being a punishment in 1853, so less than 10 years after Ellen was sent away, and it was replaced by penal servitude instead. Depending on the circumstances, a judge could also impose a lesser sentence, like penal servitude for maybe three years or more, or just imprisonment for two years with or without hard labour. So if we look at the scale of punishments available in the 1861 Act and think backwards to 1845, it does seem that penal transportation for life was part of the range of sentences available to the judge. But certainly it would have been viewed by many as you know, as bad as a death sentence um, at that time. Central to the case was obviously Ellen and William's affair. While it is mentioned in the trial, none of the charges specifically related to adultery. I asked Neve how adultery was treated in the 19th century legal system. Now, this leads our conversation into a somewhat bizarre civil charge referred to as crim con. Well, it wasn't a criminal offence to have an affair. So there was no, there was no crime of adultery in Ireland at this stage. But having an affair outside of marriage could leave a person open to action in the civil courts. So if a man's wife had an affair with another man, the husband could sue the lover. So the husband could sue the other man for damages and take take the case to court. This was something that was called an action in criminal conversation, sometimes shortened to crim con. It's a bit misleading because it it had nothing to do with the criminal law. It it was part of the civil law. 
So the terminology is a little bit odd. So these crim con cases started in England among the aristocracy in the late 18th century. And they would have been a feature of high society. Um, people would have maybe taken a case to prove adultery in advance of then seeking a divorce at a later stage. But in Ireland, this developed into something that was available to people at all social levels. So it wasn't the preserve of the wealthy elite in Ireland. And at different points, there were increases in the number of these cases that were taken. The woman usually fared quite poorly in these cases because the case was between the husband and the lover. The woman wasn't a party to the case and she wasn't allowed to testify on her own behalf. So the whole case would focus on um, her sexuality, um, her breaking of social norms, her wrongdoing, but she herself didn't get to speak at the trial and her version or her story wouldn't have been heard. This was particularly odd because for the husband to try and get the maximum amount of compensation, he would try to paint his wife as a wonderful woman, you know, with wonderful virtue, a great cook, beautiful to look at, you know, full of all the, the womanly attributes that you would want uh, in the 19th century. Because the higher her value, the more the loss to him and the more compensation he could get. Whereas the man who'd had the affair with her would take the opposite approach and he would try to say that she was not that good looking and not a great cook and a woman of loose morals and that she had seduced him and that her virtue was very questionable. So for the woman in the middle of all this, this was obviously a, an awful situation. These cases were heard in open court and they were reported in a lot of detail in the local newspapers and national papers. And because the details were really quite salacious, there was a lot of interest in, uh, in reporting and in, in reading about these cases. Sometimes in the early 19th century, these crim con actions would be a prelude to getting a parliamentary divorce, but that was really only in very elite circles. Um, parliamentary divorces were not available to ordinary people because they were so expensive and so difficult to obtain. So the people at the lower end of the socioeconomic scale who took these actions were either taking them just to get the money, to get the compensation, or the husband just felt wronged and, and wanted to have revenge or wanted to have his day in court um, and wanted to, to punish the wife and, and punish the lover in some way. In light of what Neve had said about crim con cases, I was curious if people involved in these trials would simply return home and live together after what must have been a deeply humiliating affair. As Neve now explains, while divorce may have been rare, separation wasn't. I mean, just because people were married didn't mean that they continued to live together. Um, okay. You know, we would have had, there would have been quite a lot of informal separations, people just going their separate ways, even if they weren't uh, legally divorced. Um, and we know that, you know, there was, there was quite a lot of extramarital sex happening at that time, um, as there is at all stages of history, really. So m sometimes the husband and wife reconciled after these cases, and sometimes they didn't. Finally, something that puzzled me throughout my research is why there were no charges relating to incest, given Ellen and William were cousins. Neve explains why this was the case now. The fact that they're cousins doesn't have any legal implication. It does have a bit of an ick factor. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to thank Neve for her time. Her insights really helped me get a better understanding of, of what can often be a very perplexing legal system in the 19th century. In the next episode, The Punishment, we'll continue to follow Ellen and William's story. If you want to support the show and get exclusive early access to an ad-free version of this episode, just subscribe to the show at patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast or at Acast Plus in the links below. Until next time, Sloan. <laughs>